show Michael Garapi, and you're listening to Six Articles, None the Wiser, with with, <laughs> with Ron Charette, who was with Six Nothings. <laughs> <laughs> I Hello. will come up with a name over time that you will prefer over Six Nothings. Uh, anyhow, what are we doing? What are you doing? What is everybody doing? What's I'm doing, doing pretty good. What does? I'm doing pretty good. I'm organizing uh, a lot of different things that uh, I need to sell, and also to put together shop kind of what i'm doing right now is is i got a bunch of tools and um a bunch of time so i figured that i was going to actually put together my dream of having a pseudo quasi um amateurish machine shop you, you, you told me you finally got the recording area a little bit more finalized and now we're gonna be taking a three-week break or something like that yeah <laughs> well no, no no it's not actually it's not really finalized but no but we have but a how setup. we do it yeah we, we no. officially have a microphone we can, stand we can, and and <laughs> And actually, to tell you the truth, the room sounds a little bit more echoey, which means that I'm probably releasing it of a lot of the schmoo that has been sitting in it for years. Yeah. It's a very big area, but now it sounds a little bit more echoey. So the more you clean, the worse this podcast is going to get. Well, what, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll move this to a different venue that will be uh, better for it. It's, it'll have a setup and everything like that. But right now, we're in the open. Well, while we're talking, I can hear the fireplace crackling in the distance. Yes, it's which, very harken back to which, 1930s fireside <laughs> chats. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to our first article that you have selected today. Ron has selected all six of the articles, and you have chosen choosing the right wood burning stove. <laughs> well, no, the re- okay. So the yeah. reason why I chose it, you saw the two diagrams, the two different types of stoves that are sure. out there, the catalytic and non-catalytic fireplaces. So my first question is: Have you ever thought about what exactly a catalytic converter in a car does? Have you ever? thought of that i wouldn't even be able to tell you i could not tell you where it is okay. i could i could give a guess that it converts something <laughs> yes okay so it's in the exhaust of a car it's a cylinder of sorts i mean it doesn't it could be any shape but the idea is that the exhaust passes through this cylinder and the cylinder is, is uh has a medium in it that can hold a charge of a catalyst a catalyst is a, a chemical component that kicks off a, a chemical reaction the reason why it's called a catalyst is because it's done sort of on purpose. And, you know, as opposed to mistake, I don't know. But like, right, right, again, yeah. I'm going to go down that road. <laughs> but somebody wants to do it on purpose. So right, the, sure. The, the conditions have to be met. And then the catalyst will create the reaction that will allow proper and efficient burning of exhaust. So sometimes exhaust doesn't have all of the products of it burnt. So ergo, with the catalytic converter burning the unburnt exhaust products, that's what a catalytic fireplace does is that the catalyst is placed in line with the exhaust and that allows the unburnt wood smoke yeah. to be properly burned or efficient more efficiently burned so that you don't get as much creosote and things like could, that could we call it filtering or would that be inappropriate to use that yeah. term well so that's that's the interesting thing is that it it's so it acts like a filter to trap the byproducts of wood burning essentially turn into ash after they're done so it's it's a self-cleaning filter which you, you could think about it like yeah that. Because the article you have to point to me said like it can last for like six years, assuming you're done putting if you're junk really in there. Good with, you know? so, so you know, well, that's the same thing with like a life of a car. Is that yeah. the conditions are supposed to be set so that when you actually are running a car, that it has a warm enough temperature in the exhaust yeah. to properly burn in a catalytic converter. If you're really in a cold climate all the time, I could see that potentially being an issue. This is one of the things I'd be rather interested in because the whole entire point behind doing this in the first place is well. Many reasons. I don't want to actually make it like this is the entire point. But like EPA standards for putting smoke into the air, you're trying to avoid yeah. uh, causing a dirty amount of smoke here. Yeah, in the it's air. not like, you know, it's, and I, I, I kind of it's, not, it's not like the, the EPA is, is trying to, um, you know, save. Uh, some sort of weird roach that's living in the swamp. Unless you're living in, in like San Francisco, they're probably not coming after your house and targeting you. Although they, they may be choosing what stoves might be on the market. Well, um, exactly. It's yeah. more like what stoves are, are, are on the market. And, you know, of course, it's a wood burning stove. They're not really that complicated to begin with. So you, the modifications aren't that difficult and removing it isn't necessarily that difficult either. The thought process in my head is like, well, if you're still wood burning, so you're still releasing gases. That can't be as clean as how we normally get electricity. But is it as clean as how we normally get electricity? Like if you compared like the the factories that are just dumping materials into the air, well, or that, like that's, or that's pouring sort of, it into a lake. That's sort of the goal. Is that wood burning? I mean, compared to like let's say burning gasoline. It Obviously, like, it's a natural resource that we're supplied by and can resupply. You know, yeah, so that's pounds, one of the benefits. Yeah, pounds per BTU and things like that. 
most people in, in in cities, you know, they don't burn wood because it's you know it's almost like the fire of London type thing where it's like you don't want to you don't want to have open fire in an area where there's a lot of people. The idea freaks people out, and, and well, we no, come no, a long no, way from because it's, it's all, there's also valid reasons for it. You know, a lot of these wood burning stoves they're not in cities; they're in towns, and so it does add in a little extra cost to people that don't live in these big cities. All things considered, buy these wood stoves that are now technologically advanced to the point where. They're almost a little bit out of their price range. It's also a little bit harder to just find wood randomly kicking around in the city. You know, if you're in an actual city, you kind of have to go out of your way to pull cords of wood in. Yeah. By that point, so you it's, might it's as well. Really, yeah. yeah it, from an economic standpoint, I mean, that's that's why pellet stoves, for instance, are something that, you know, you'd see more in like a, a suburban environment. And pellets, you know, have their own mechanisms for burning. And I'm sure that there's probably catalyst in there as well. But from a, you know, like again, a pound per BTU level, uh, wood is not very that efficient. It sounds kind of odd, but charcoal is actually more efficient than wood. Because wood has, again, byproducts in it that get burnt up that can create, not necessarily very toxic, but I mean, it just creates a, a less cleaner exhaust that can build up in the chimney and cause fires and also can settle on the ground in the immediate area and also get in the lungs of people that are in the area as well. If you're burning to the point where you're creating a lot of smoke, you're probably not doing it right anyway. You know, if you're properly burning in a wood stove, you should have very little smoke. And this is a lot of information real quick. <laughs> but that's what I'm trying to say is that it gets complicated. Yeah. And, and people that burn wood stoves aren't necessarily looking, you know, they're looking to simplify their lives. Now, they're not looking to make it complex. So my, my uncle used to sell wood stoves. This goes back maybe the 90s and whatnot. But like, so, like, so I know every single time I visited him and I'd be like inside his shop, just, you know, I'm a kid. But, like, every person who comes in, it's a gigantic conversation every single time. And it's one you have to repeat over and over and over again. I'm sure you know this whole entire thing from having sold uh, sold pools back in the day. Every person who comes in, all of a sudden, all this information gets dropped on them every time. And, they, and yeah, it's very difficult to, to maintain. Let's say, uh, from my perspective, when, I look, when I'm listening to all this information being dumped at me, I really have to focus and I really have to say, okay, well, actively listen and try to pick out things that I can, you know, potentially ask questions about and kind of further my understanding. This is more like a monologue, so I'm, I am dumping a lot of questions without <laughs> providing a lot of feedback or getting a lot of feedback. But that, and that's why, you know, kind of like why I'm doing it to begin with is that these topics are actually very interesting and they're very important. And you know, if there's any discussion that can be had in conjunction with this, I think more power to it. Yeah, you know? I um, mean, I find Woodstock to be utterly fascinating, and I'm glad I'm not a homeowner because it would be something that I would think about forever. I would just spend yeah. all my time thinking, should I be getting a stove? For <laughs> like well, it would be something that would pop up every six months. Well, that's you that's know? kind of well, that's what I have been I had been doing for the past few years, and I was like, screw, it, I'm just going to get a stove because the only way you're going to learn about it is if you have a stove. Yeah, you get in the middle. So, of it. so I mean, I, I had wood stoves. You know, my, my family had wood stoves growing up, and and I was you know very much around them and familiar with them to a point. But now I know so much more, and I'm glad that I do. Because because they are, you know, I, I don't think that they should go away. And I think there there is some stigma to them because of, like, again, the rash of fires that occur because people don't know how to treat them. They, they buy a, a house and they don't know how they don't know that they need to clean a chimney or they don't know that, that when they burn wood, they shouldn't burn certain types of wood. These aren't called dangerous for a reason. These are dangerous things. It's, it's funny because it's not that natural gas isn't dangerous itself. We just last year had this problem with multiple houses exploding in Andover and Lawrence. Oh, so yeah, in, in our um, immediate area, we had that um, the national grid, uh, and uh, sorry to name drop, but but an overpressurization of some some uh, gas lines that were not meant for for uh, high pressure. No, it was and, like and, 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 but a like what's minor, happening? What's happening yeah, in the city? Yeah. is that you know they're trying to upgrade the lines. And, and you have a mix of high pressure and low pressure lines. And so, you know, all these aging systems, they're trying to update them. Well, I'm not saying they crossed any lines that, that might have not happened. They might have had a failed regulator or something like that. But when you have a mesh of, you know, again, it, com it makes it complex. You have high pressure lines in with low pressure lines. I mean, this type of thing can happen. You know, and that's what happened is that is there's an overpressurization of the lines. Some of the houses received more gas pressure than they should have causing, like, let's say, pilot flames to go higher to cause explosions yeah. in, in, in some of the uh, appliances that are in those homes. Gas uh, fireplaces, gas dryers, you know, stoves of all types. There's electric stoves, there's pilot stoves, and things like that. And, yeah, the fallout and, from that also, they're still dealing with it, which is kind of crazy. It just happens like a year and a half ago or something like that. And there are still lines that need to be replaced immediately, and they're sending people out there, and they're shutting things down, and warning signs, and... Gas well, I think that there was there was a strike as well. National yeah. Grid had a strike last was it last year I think after the after the major part of the incident 
I don't know what the resolve was. They in actually that. almost like, had. That's probably something. What that a we should, strange time. That's something that we should kick on. Is yeah. like, is is what happened to that union versus national grid thing? That might be an interesting topic because I don't think I'll, I don't I don't. We, know we should get into it because it's actually it's it's a really interesting subject and it's very local. Like uh, on top of all that, they it's almost local, had, but we have we have local knowledge. Yeah. of a topic that is is actually pretty important. They almost had the same exact problem happen in Bill Ricca approximately two weeks later. And it got caught just before it actually blew the lines. And it's just absolutely crazy that, you know, the problem was happening three cities over. If it happened to them twice in a row, there wouldn't be a national grid in, in New England anymore. They would have just been kicked out. You can't have multiple disasters happen uh, simultaneously. Well, I don't know. I mean, it really... Uh, it really depends on how much uh, how much money they dump into the system. I don't know. Stuff. But getting back to... I don't even know how we shoot on that. But... <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're talking about, like, how unsafe... A wood burning stove could be. Oh, but yeah, but anything, anything, everything um, is to some extent unsafe. Exactly. Understanding how things operate, especially when you know buyer beware, caveat emptor, I think is very important here. Um, and, and that's kind of what I was trying to say was that those that might have wood stove, there's a lot of information on the topic. You know, there's a lot of YouTube videos. There's this, this. I think it was. Well, it's not an EPA art. I know it is an EPA article, the one that I, I put forward. And it, and it kind of shows, you know, what's the difference between uh, older wood burning stoves, which are non catalytic. It shows the wood, the air travel, and how it's important. And it also shows the air travel for catalytic stoves and how that's important too. It goes beyond that. But I thought it was a good place to start because, you know, airflow in a wood burning stove is, it's, I mean, there's three things that are important fuel, heat, and oxygen. That's what they call it a fire triangle. It's kind of like the most, you know, basest one, you know, the, the next basest one I think would be wood. And then once you have the two together, then you create the heat and then you have your sustaining fire. Anyway. Yeah, no, let's move forward. Okay. So you pulled up an article by the name of Viruses Help Keep the Gut Healthy. And this was specifically a, a science firm who proved that there were viruses out there that would help, that were helping out mice. I'm a little bit surprised this had to be proven. I just kind of assumed, obviously, there are germs and bacteria that keep the human body in a healthy condition. I would have automatically assumed there were viruses that are also keeping the human body in, 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 a, in a healthy condition. I wasn't aware that this was so controversial. The idea that uh, noroviruses specifically are working to keep bad germs out of the body. Well, viruses attack any cell. The idea behind this article I thought was important was to highlight the fact that bacteria in the body are 90% of the genetic material in everyone. Now, that doesn't mean that it's 90% by weight. It just means it's 90% by the, the type of genetic material that it is. You know, a lot of that, for instance, is poised in the gut. It's a lot of recent research has been made to, to talk about gut health and how that's important. I don't think that that's very much controversial anymore either. That's actually something that's been, it's sort of been put to bed, you know, only in the past few years, I think. I think there's still a lot of argument as to the, the, the value how's of it, probiotics. How's, how's definitely but, not understood. But and yeah. there's a lot of mechanisms that can be considered quackery. Some companies like to just grasp onto one idea and then just sell you something. Yeah. So um, that's yeah, where some of the confusion it's a holistic, comes in. So that's what I was trying to put forward is that, you know, all this, this is a very holistic thing in the sense that it has a lot of pieces that need to be brought to the table to afford somebody with, to provide them a healthy gut. Yeah. This is kind of just one of the things that is unproven to a nth degree yeah. that is kind of like an unknown in the medical community regarding gut health. This is one of the things, like, I want to cut you off early, and you're, I'm glad you actually went through and stopped me. But, like, when you said that uh, viruses attack cells, it's that wording all of a sudden rankled me because viruses hack cells. They make cells work for them. A virus will go in, recode the DNA, and make new virus cells. That's kind of the point of a virus. Right. Um, Viruses are not cells themselves. No, they're not cells themselves. They're uh, called they're, capsids. Whether or not they're living is an, a, a philosophical argument for scientists that yeah. have been going on for a very, very it's, long it's, time. That's a fun argument, but it's, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. One of the, also, the inter other interesting thing about uh, viruses is that there are evolutionary leaps that happen on occasion that are sometimes attributed to maybe this was a virus. Idea that like a virus got into a cell, hacked a cell, changed the system of the animal, and it seemed to have changed something for the better. And the animal kept that new hack as like these sort of weird quasi jump forwards. Obviously, it's never like all of a sudden you sprout wings because that's not how evolution works. Mm -hmm. But um, the idea that, oh, this one thing that happened to hack the system, turns out we were able to process oxygen better. It was something good. And it became a trait that got got evolved toward. Yeah, like, so we don't catalog 
every mutation. Yeah. Well, at least I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how possible that is to do. So to understand the full methods and means of commuting traits, I think it's it's much more chaotic. I would imagine it to be. I, you know, I mean, obviously the outcome is important, but again, it's like tracing it back to something is, is very difficult. Yeah, that's so, very... we, you know, it's kind of highlighted these days because viruses are very important in today's society and understanding. And the funny thing is, is that it shows our weakness in our ability to, to fully understand it, to bring forward solutions for, for things that, for viruses specifically, but for, for, for things that are relatively unknown and mutated to the point where they're not recognizable. Yeah. The it's funny, very important. The funny very thing is, for the previous episode, when I was actually pulling together stuff, I was looking for, through all different sources. And one of the things I was looking through is r slash ask science, because there's all kinds of interesting questions that pop up in there. And right now, r slash ask science is at least 50% questions about viruses. Obviously because of the coronavirus phenomenon that's going on right now, but also just because people are learning so much about coronavirus, it's spilling out all sorts of information. They want to know all kinds of things about viruses because it turns out they're pretty fascinating. You can't even call them creatures. Like, what exactly are these things? They're pretty fascinating viruses. They're a category of their own. So what, do creatures have legs that can move? Are they creepers? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the dif- difference between a, a creature and a and a living thing is. Yeah, but I don't know. Um, it's... No, well, I mean, I'm not calling it living or unliving. But yeah. like, What I'm trying to say is that uh, actually, can you have a can you have an unliving creature? I mean, I I can can a washing machine be a creature? <laughs> it be Does a it qualify under the dictionary well, definition? Can it be a you know? monster? Yeah. I mean. Uh, yeah. I think it's all in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. But like, okay. Yeah. So you're saying that a lot of uh, people are... It seem to all of a sudden spontaneously be very interested in the medical sciences and very specifically viruses right now. It seems to be like this spillover because obviously it's all the news is nothing but coronavirus right now. I partially regret having any conversation that has anything to do with the coronavirus right now just because there's so much of it. But at the same exact time, it's also kind of almost impossible to avoid. And maybe it's best to not try to avoid it because it's important too. But it's interesting to see so many, so many people kind of getting involved in science in a way that they wouldn't mm. beforehand. And it's kind of, to put a silver lining on thing, interesting to see many people kind of moving away from politics and moving into science in their, in their news watching. Obviously, I, the politics will always be there. I personally have taken a different tack, not necessarily as of late, but it's, it's been slow, slowly happening because I've left certain topics. I've left them to the side. And then when I pick them back up again, it's almost like I'm dusting them off and looking at them like an old record, like, oh, I remember this fondly. And instead of addressing it, perhaps the, the mind that I had at the time, I'm addressing it with different eyes because I haven't thought about it like that since. As a result, I'm not going back to thinking in the old way I was. I'm going to try to attack it in the new way. I tend to agree with what you're saying in the fact that when I look at things these days, I don't look at them in terms of as an aggressive stance anymore. Like when it comes to like, let's say politics or science or anything like that. For me, it's more like it's a curiosity now Yeah. where I think, you know, that, that lends better for me to be able to seek out answers and to sort of try and understand, you know, where people are coming from, you know, without having to take their, what they say is a, a weight or a standard on first blush, but be able to actually listen to that and to see where they're coming from. I think that there's certain maturity to the concept of, like, learning is not a game you can win. That's not how learning works. Well, curiosity, uh, to me, is very important, as well as communication. Those might be the two pillars. There might be more pillars. But curiosity and communication, I think, are vital to any learning process. With regarding viruses, this is, it's a very complex topic, and there's much more to be learned. I hope that it does bring about a, a sort of... Um, I feel like we're going to have a generation of, if not a generation of doctors, a generation of people who are who are much more interested in the medical sciences. It will be casually something they're into in the same way that some people are just into movies. That well, those are kind of, people that are into medicine. We are getting a little off topic, but when you think about it, 23andMe and all those different DNA-related websites uh, or companies that you know offer services, that kind of brought DNA to the forefront and people started thinking about it more. And I, after that, I, I, I quickly started noticing how nutrition became more important to people as a result of that. And I'm not sure, or I mean, I, I thought it was as a result of it, but I'm not sure. So I think that on the whole, a lot of these 
he's scientitious, I guess you, I don't know. <laughs> like, it's not necessarily scientific, but it's related to science. All these scientific or scientitious things, uh, for lack of a better word, are becoming more globally aware. Yeah. Say. And I, and I don't think it's necessarily from a point of, you know, not common sense. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense. A lot of things that make sense to me are being are, are hitting my ears, and I'm I'm hearing it, and I'm saying, you know what? It's like people are. I, th- I think the people I've talked to, or the people I've listened to, are are taking it with different eyes. All I have to say is, if this doesn't spawn into a spectacular medical drama five years from now, I'll be horribly upset with humanity mm-hmm. for having wasted <laughs> at least that opportunity with a, a new interest in subjects like this, and we don't end up with something that's either as good as House or better. So you liked House? I thought House was a good show. Although, I gotta be honest with you, House bugged the heck out of me every single time I sat down and watched it because my friends were kind of into House and we sit down and be like, oh man, this guy is an ass. When I did get over it, I found the show to be really good. I never forgave the main character. I don't like that that idea of a main character just being a complete jerk. Um, so, like, um, obviously they made him sympathetic, but that didn't actually get me past the fact that it's still not fun to watch someone being a jerk. But the show is is put together incredibly well despite that. So I just learned to accept the character and move forward. So I feel like, you know, House is a very polarizing character. I figure most people don't get past the second episode of House if they don't like his personality. It's actually, I think it's probably rare that a person puts up with it to actually get far enough into the series and be like, okay, this is fine. I accept this at this point. It was very formulaic from what I oh, yeah, definitely that. grasped from it. It's like, you know, I mean, obviously every... Successful sitcoms seem to have a pattern where they have to have a thirty-minute arc, but yeah. they can have they can have grander arcs, you know, that kind of fit into that. House was made in this weird time period, like Grey's like, Anatomy, I think, you know, fit that description. Oh yeah, as well. yeah, you know, but that's also from. A, a I, I suppose the real question is, is like, so let's say medical drama in the future, will there be the case of the week as we have going all the way back to the nineteen fifties of medical dramas, or will we actually get an ongoing investigation? There's this one case, and we're working on it, and we're working on it, and we're working on it. That would be great. And like seven weeks of just this one patient, which I know this sounds really silly for me to advertise Say Hello to Blackjack. It happens on Say Hello to Blackjack, the audio drama, which I produce, but... um, (laughs) Which which I I have uh, been characters in. And I'm not on the website. Uh, I, I, yeah, but I mean, I'm like, uncredited. That's an that's an audio <laughs> that's, sag. No, that's an audio not. drama based <laughs> on like a, a Japanese manga that came out in 2000. It's kind of funny because it's actually it'll be interesting to see. I, I expect there'll probably be a, a show that's like that that'll come up sometime in the future uh, where they just spend all their time on one patient each season. That's how Say Hello well, to John, Blackjack Well, John, can you works. can you go in a little bit more about Say Hello to Blackjack and oh. how that would be different from, let's say, House? My apologize for advertising right now. People. No, no. no. <laughs> okay. This is not advertising. This no. is discussion because, like I said, so, I, that would be something that I really would enjoy. I considered Say Hello to Blackjack to be more of a medical drama and less of something that would be more like a, a documentary of sorts. But now I'm seeing, you know, there could be parallels. So, like, you know, another thing is that Say Hello to Blackjack is based in Japanese culture. It is. And it's written for Japanese culture. It was originally and, written for Japanese people, very specifically for the Japanese medical system. Yeah. Uh, which makes it a really strange thing for Americans to pick up. But Say Hello to Blackjack is based off of the work of Shuho Seito, who, who wrote this back in 2000. Uh, he has uh, some amount of medical training that I do not have. Somewhere around 2015, 2016, he, he released it royalty-free which is the reason why I, I jumped on and said, hey, I'm already looking to make an audio drama. Let's make it out of this. And it's based around a doctor by the name of uh, Saito. And Saito is top of his class, one of the best medical colleges out there, comes out of his college and starts working for the medical system, the hospital that's attached to his school, and starts to find that the real world of medicine is nothing like his books told him, nothing like his professors told him. It's full of really tough ethical questions, really hard things like, who is the most important person when dealing with a patient's care? Is it the, the hospital itself or is it the family? Or questions along the lines of when do we give up on a patient? Or when is a glut of doctors a bad thing? When, when are too many doctors actually more problem than one good doctor? It isn't technically by season in the manga, but I have it split up by season as in like each season really focuses on one patient. Season one was five uh, episodes long, and season two was uh, 14 episodes long. How does it compare to House specifically? Both of them are dealing with incredibly smart doctors who are very good at their job. 
and probably know better than the medical establishment that they're working with. But House is coming from the point of view of an old veteran who's trying to work outside the system because he knows better and he's incredibly egotistical about his knowledge. While Sato is incredibly inexperienced, albeit he knows quite a bit about what he's doing, and he's constantly having to second guess if he is the most knowledgeable person or if the hospital knows more than he does. That sort of lack of conviction can drive a person crazy. I think one of the differences also, like, Say Hello to Blackjack is very good at pointing at the system and saying, like, this is the problem with the medical system we have right now, because it was made specifically as almost a counterculture attack on the Japanese medical system. Okay. You can tell there's a lot of that going on in there. And House is just a general, the hospital doesn't want me to do thing X, but I want to do thing Y. There's no real attack on the medical system going on with that show. So with regard to episodic versus uh, season arcs, say hello to Blackjack. Does it have episodic modes and, and what is the actual what would no, you say would be not really in that way it's it's really very heavy on the arc it really just follows one patient obviously each issue will have a certain dynamic to it um and we might be introduced to a new character or something like that but it's following an arc that I, i'm trying to think of like what that would be like because we don't actually do that with I guess I don't i know these shows exist i guess i just don't watch television <laughs> is the actual answer Okay. Like, there must be some investigative police show out there that's the ongoing case, right? Or are they all based on, like, oh, in an hour we're going to finish and wrap this all up? I don't know. I I, I don't watch those shows. Yeah, you know? I mean, I, I guess we're just highlighting two different shows that uh, we are familiar with, the, the difference between them. I'm going to contrast that a little bit. Um, there's a It's a little bit related in the sense of it has to do with exploration. One of my most favorite shows that I watch from start to finish was actually Star Trek Enterprise with Scott Bakula. And I relate to Scott Bakula, or I related to him when I was a kid. He just seemed like a likable guy. But, like, you know, I didn't ever watch Star Trek Enterprise when it was released. And when it was over, it was over, and I just went on, kept on going on with my life, never really paying, atten paying any attention. I was given the opportunity to see the whole series, and I actually ended up liking it and continued to watch it until, I, until it was finished. It did have a lot of episodic nature to it. It did have a lot of uh, season-long arcs. It had longer arcs as well. I thought it was a really well-written show. But I'm just contrasting that with what you were just talking about because it was just a topic that I was interested in. Obviously, the Star Trek formula, just like the house formula, is we have a problem, has to be solved in half an hour right. or an hour. An hour. How are we going to do that? But it was all, all fiction. And I think with House, it's, it's a lot of fiction, too. There is a very big, difficult nature to complex problems like that, that, you know, potentially, are, you know, you're looking in, in different directions and you're not really finding your problem, but you have this purpose-driven, you know, scenario and you have this passion to do it. And it doesn't matter how it gets done, it just gets done. That's kind of what drove me to both. This is where I was at the time, was I was very purpose-driven. And to see somebody else in the same type of a, a situation, it really kind of resonated with me and that's why I enjoyed the show. And I'm not sure if that actually gets to the point where we're going with that little skew, which is, you know, the relatability of a subject, you know. What type of person do people latch on to on a broad basis? I don't know. Uh, is, it, is it the same formulaic group of people, or is it, a, is it a different set of people? Definitely up for discussion. Definitely. I hate to cut off this discussion, but if we don't, we'll never get all through six articles no, today. No, <laughs> no, we won't. That was kind of like two. Yeah, we, 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 we kind of threw two together there. So let's... I guess maybe we jump we should, from that. Direct maybe we should call that too. So, like, what was what was the number? Like, we've done done three so far. Uh, in theory, we've done three. Okay, let's, you wanna... call, let's call it three. Okay, we'll call it three. We'll, we'll I don't those. know what the third article is technically. Maybe we'll find some more. We'll f <laughs> say hello to blackjack dot com the website. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we'll actually. link to that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll call it at that. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ron, I want to know: Do you have a spirit animal? Have you no. actually thought? So this is the art this article is called. Do you have a spirit animals from? PsychCentral.com. Why'd you pull this forward out of curiosity? Why are we talking about Patronuses right now? Well, because it's something that is in fiction, based in fiction and everything like that. Patronus, that's kind that, of like the term. That's really up. the Harry Potter steal yeah. of, a, of a spirit animal. There's also a witch and a warlock have a, have a familiar. Familiar? Sure. Yeah. I'm not so, sure if you call that a spirit animal, though. A spirit animal is supposed to be like an animal that you kind of... I don't know. I feel like it is. This is an interesting idea, because like so, if you are sharing mind space with a cat, let's say, and you're a witch. Sure, that's your spirit animal. I get where that connection is being made. So this is an interesting breakdown. I'll just read the bullet points. We don't choose our spirit animal, but instead the animal chooses us. All of us have a number of spirit animals. We're not confined to one. 
animals teach us wisdom of their specific species. Spirit animals are with us for the lifespan and do not go away. And once an animal becomes extinct, the collective wisdom of that animal is gone forever. I like the idea that there was this list put down as if we're like, okay, check, check, check. We got all this done. For something that is <laughs> is generally considered, I don't know how, how to put this. You don't make checklists of things that are on the spiritual realm. That's not that's not the way it works normally. It almost feels like a Dungeons and Dragons manual once you make a checklist. It's like, oh, this is what the creature does. Got it. It has plus seven to attack and it deals 1d6 damage. How do you feel about the concept of spirit animals? Do you think people actually have them? Well, this is a psychology-based article, right? Some people feel more strongly about it than others. I would consider what you said earlier to be very valid, that Patronus can be technically different from a familiar, and in each can have a different subclass. So, like, you know, if there's, and this is all fiction, obviously, but the idea is that not all familiars are created equal. Familiars and the attachment to, like, let's say the host is different. But that's what I'm trying to say, is that the idea behind a spirit animal is something that people very really feel i don't like again i don't have one i don't feel yeah. like i have one I, I could probably you know i could probably do the test and search for one but like what i'm trying to say is that i've always found that kind of interesting because calling something a spirit animal seems like it makes it more real in reality as opposed to like saying oh well i, I have a familiar you know? I, I also kind of find this kind of funny because i i oftentimes wonder if the end result when a person when you ask a person what is your spirit animal if they have a ready answer for you is it just always their favorite animal do they make a conscious decision to not have their favorite animal be their spirit animal? Is well, that technically the same that's question? That's, I think, is a, is a very interesting point made in the article. And that's yeah. something I did not consider. A spirit animal does not choose you. Or yeah. so it chooses you, you don't choose the spirit animal. You don't choose animal. the spirit Sorry. animal. Yes. So there's people that, for instance, are attracted to cows. They love cows. They, th they think that everything about cows is awesome. They collect cow memorabilia. Um, they might even have some themselves. And, and they're all about them. Does it mean that their spirit animal is a cow? It almost seems like that's kind of like counterintuitive to what psychology would sort of purport would be a spirit animal. A spirit animal, it seems, would be like something that you would be, not something that you like. To me, that's what I that's what I feel like. That's why I think that that's why I think the article kind of conveys. There's a character in the the comic book, The Max, where I cannot remember the name of the character. She's got black hair and she's kind of used as a straight person, but like as a damaged straight person. And she kind of like sits on the side of a building and stares at another building and the other building has a bust of a horse on it. And because the bust of the horse is there, it becomes her spirit animal and she identifies with it. And I get the impression that that's kind of supposed to be the, the sort of way you're supposed to get it. Like it's supposed to be like, oh, it's the thing I'm looking at right now when you're looking at it and you're thinking of it. Can there be spirit plants? I, I don't know. It's really funny because this article didn't seem to indicate that that was a possibility, but I can't see why somebody can't have a spirit animal be a sequoia. It seems to make sense to me. Can there be spirit uh, machinery? Can can your spirit animal be a lawnmower? Is it absurd to think, or is it is well, it I mean, more rational than? But that's what I'm trying to say from the psychological perspective. Why does it have to be an animal? It's a very valid point that you're making, I think. But uh, from a psychological perspective, what is a spirit animal doing? It's essentially something that is adjunct to a person. So it technically could be anything. We really need someone in here that actually has a spirit animal to, to talk to us about this. Because yeah. I do actually find this idea to be interesting. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't quite buy into stuff like this. But I, I do like talking about stuff like this. That's, yeah. that's what it mostly so you, comes to. you don't into. have any anything. If I, part of the problem is if I was actually to think of what my spirit animal was, and I was to actually think about it, and this problem is I think you're not supposed to think about this sort of thing, it's probably a swamp rat. <laughs> <laughs> okay because because just off the idea that one day i found a swamp rat in our yard and i was like this guy is acting pretty cool <laughs> like did not really care about was whether he, or not it was there was he back stroking in your pool or something no he, he was just like out in front of the field just digging for grubs and like i noticed he'd come out and he just was pretty chill about the fact that i was just hanging around in the field too and would just kind of do his thing and i thought i thought that that was actually kind of cool and i had to do some research so I, I didn't know what a swamp rat was, but it was evidently coming up from the swamp. And it was, they're not rats. They're just, they're in the rodent family. Okay. Um, Interesting. But so aren't beavers. So, yeah. you know, if you don't okay. freak out about certain oh, rodents. But yeah. No. Yeah, if anybody has a spirit animal, I'd like to hear from you. I, I, if I would, like, if I was to point to, like, one awesome spirit animal, I think skunks are awesome. I think they're great animals. I think Pepper Le Pew is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like skunks, like if you remove a skunk's scent sac and you, like as a baby and you just bring it into the house, 
it's the one of the most social animals you'll ever come across. It's incredibly cuddly because the skunks don't. Their entire defense mechanism relies off of them spraying things and walking away, and nothing messes with it except for the one time that something does mess with it and it learns its lesson. Mm. So they oftentimes they kind of live through life without really worrying about predators in the same way that other animals do. So they don't get defensive. It's not built into them to be defensive. All right. So you have a very deep connection to swamp rats. <laughs> I like I, swamp rats. Now we're I like skunks. Now we're, yeah, I'm partial skunks. to rabbits. These are the things that end up in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's actually, that's that's probably relevant in some way. That's interesting. Okay, next. Next. Let's talk about some time travel stories. <laughs> oh, I don't yeah, know how to transition no, this correctly. No, I don't want to go no, no, say something like, John, there, there's no, there doesn't always have to be a segue. When we say next, it's like next. Segway. Okay, now we have to talk about real types of time travel. True and, time and travel stories. Amazing real, type, real life stories. True types, they exist? They this, don't, how can they possibly exist? This article uh, kind of jumps around, to be honest with you. It's really just it's an advertisement book. for a book. It, no, it is a book. I it's mean, the yeah. beginning of a book. Oh, you go to the, Amazon.com, it's, it's you look book. up true time travel stories, and this book comes up. You can go, look. You can do a preview of it, and it gives you the first story. This feel, Yeah, this feels now, more like a series of short stories, but like off Here's of, the background. Okay, time travel. What is it? The idea behind time travel is that, you know, you can go forwards or you can go backwards, but the idea is that a whole being supposedly supposed to traverse from one frame of reference in time to another frame of reference in time, potentially affecting the area around it. So, you know, there's been situations, for instance, like I, I said Scott Bakula earlier, I, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. if that was on the brain <laughs> or not, but the idea is that Quantum Leap, he went in as essentially another person back in time. But then, you know, you had Star Trek Enterprise where he did the same thing. He went, he time traveled. You can go forward in time, you can go backwards in time. You can either be a, a stand-in for somebody else. You can be invisible to everyone else. Or you could uh, be your own person in that place. This is one of those questions of, like, how would time travel work in a universe where we can't seem to have ever identified any time travelers and, and all of this in a was, really official capacity? Yeah, this is like a, this is like a fictional perspective. So I like, have to admit, I like the introduction much more. I found the introduction much more interesting than the actual story he had to tell because I really like the idea of what philosophers have thought of time travel before 1860 something when uh, Yankee and King Arthur's Court was written, which is considered one of the first real time traveling stories, the actual first real time travel story, Rip Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle is a story of a man who goes to sleep and finds out what America is going to be like in the future. He's, I don't know how that ends. He might be stuck there. Maybe he is. Can you unsleep? Just seems weird. But it was one of the first times someone wrote a speculative fiction story and said, hey, what will the country be like? It's a, a fascinating move for an 18th century writer to actually pull that stunt. Mm. It's strange that the idea of time is such a very old concept, but the idea of a time traveler is a very modern concept. That's not something that actually goes back very far. Uh, well, not, not something... I should, so, I should clarify, outside it's of... It's been considered like... Inside the, you know, of Western traditions, no, because once you start actually monkeying with like yeah, what aborigines say, thought like, and stuff like that then, then been, you're just like well okay i think in i think in, in in past times i've seen themes which i thought were sort of relative to how people would uh expect time travel to work back in those days when they called people like hundreds of years old what were they referring to i don't know when they uh like vampires for instance that could live for hundreds of years or in the bible when people were supposedly hundreds of years old. Uh, who knows how the culture thought of it. But, like, what I think is kind of the thread to all that, and like kind of like where you're going with the Rip Van Winkle story, I think, where Stephen Hawking kind of ended up saying that time travel, if it was possible, would only technically be possible towards the future. And so that limits your options in time travel fiction. When Einstein first came up with the idea of time being relative, sort of took people's minds and invent them a little bit no pun intended but like the idea behind that is that you could technically go forward in time and realistically theoretically you could reverse time but again what with what reference yeah <laughs> you know I, I mean that's some strong math right there i do like i i know it's really almost silly to bring forward the marvel universe but i do like the marvel universe's answer to time travel stories which is that when you go forward and come back in time and you've changed something, you haven't really changed anything at all. What you've done is you've made a divergent universe 
and one universe is going to split off and one universe is going to do. So it feels like you've changed history and you have changed history as far as the timeline you're in is concerned. But there's also a timeline which you just disappeared and that's the end. Like as soon as you time travel, you boop, you split the paths and one you just disappeared and end up in another dimension and the other one just keeps going without you. And things probably got worse because you aren't there. But that's a whole other phys- uh, physical... The multiverse theory is a whole other that's bag like, of bananas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, is, that, is that really time travel? I mean, well, that's Well, that's, no. that's their way of solving the problem. Because technically, since technically impossible, instead, we use multiverse theory. But I know? think what Hawking was saying specifically was that in that specific universe, not yeah. in the multiverse, you're not going to go to another universe. You're going to go within the current universe... You use space-time to make a bridge, and that bridge pushes you somewhere to a future date. Yeah, like, the idea behind, for instance, uh, technically, I would think, like, a wormhole could potentially be a multiverse concept, but it also could potentially be a, uh, a forward future concept. How do you reconcile that? Can it be one or the other? Can it be both? And is there an actual value to, like, where is the value to people besides that I want to see what the future looks like. Like, yeah. how can you exploit that? There's no exploit to only sending in the future. Unless you're helping people in the future learn more about their past. So I suppose you could all, all, always look at it that way as a value thing. Yeah, and uh, something would kick this off. I was recently watching a, uh, a Nova series, uh, which is on Netflix, that talks about black holes. And they all had different concepts on to, to sort of bring forward as to what all these black holes meant, you know, from, you know, where we thought about it from the times that they were, you know, this, all these theories were discovered and all of the findings, all the evidence was made, collected and, and brought forward. When they were done, they really didn't talk about time travel at all. Like they were just talking about it in terms of like what they understand the black hole to do. Which, there's a lot of quantum physics related items that were a part of the black hole problem. And a lot of direct evidence that has been discovered as a result of inventions that tried to pinpoint gravity and mass and things like that. So that's why I you know, wanted to take a look at you know, something behind that that was kind of missing. And I'm not saying that this particular book has any validity to it at all, but the anecdotal evidence for time travel is what we're talking about here, essentially. Um, so one of the stories that is in there it talks about um, the Israelis uh, using a device that was created by a TV repairman, an appliance repairman, one of the first in, in the country, in the United States, that went out on his own. He was supposedly able to freeze time, which is still, in my opinion, a forward future related item. Freezing time is a way of manipulating time towards the future. Oh, yeah. Just as much as speeding time up to get to the future. Those are the two concepts that, that are put forward. I But I couldn't help being reminded of, it's a very small short which I've always loved by the name of the Con Time Machine. Did I ever show... I must have showed you the Con Time Machine. It was a part of Channel 101, which, if I tried to explain that, we'd be here for another 20 minutes. But uh, it's Dan Harmon started Channel 101 before he did all of the Rick and Morty stuff and all the community stuff. So if, if you're interested in what Channel 101 might be, I'll link to Channel 101. But there's a short by the name of the Con Time Machine. It starts off with a scientist asking someone, like, what do you know about time travel? And the other person goes, well, only that is a very common practice. Um, and then he explains to him that he's created a con time machine that doesn't travel back to the past. It doesn't travel into the future. It travels with the present at the same exact time. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get inside the con time machine, which is roughly a cardboard box. And they're traveling through time <laughs> at the same rate as the rest of time. And then they get out of the con time machine and someone says, the president's been shot. <laughs> like that ends the episode. <laughs> oh my Whenever I hear somebody talking about like, oh, we're just going to like freeze time. I, I cannot stop but think of the con yeah. time machine. That is very funny. <laughs> we're uh, we're going to take a break now and we will get back. In a moment, we're going to dance around like fools. Yes. Intermission time. Intermission time. Grind your heels into the sheets. Grit your teeth and get some sleep this evening. Counting sheep.
Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. You're a hack. I you am. finally found out what you're doing. You're a hack. Man. And your whole family is Bunch misconstruing. So, our final article is fictional bands we wish were real. An example. I think their first choice is the best example. In- this was put forward, by the way, by Kerrang. Kerrang, uh, I think, is a website that's like a heavy metal website. Oh, interesting. So, you know, it's just like... so. They're, they're, well, obviously, they're going to have a certain lean, that being the case. Yeah, um, yeah I would think so. Like, uh, that's why it's like, I don't think this list is definitive. Not so, oh, no, not obviously so, but... not. Um, obviously, they're going to put this as Spinal Tap in there. You know, like, that's... They are, John? Yeah. Is I... that a spoiler? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think that that's... You can't avoid that. There's no rock magazine that's going to say that this is Spinal Tap isn't worth talking about. Yeah, and they're right. not going to forget it. That's true. You know? That's true. Um, I think that's I, true. My, my, I presume that the uh, best way to explain what they mean, though, is the, is the, one, is the Sunnydale High band uh, Dingo's Ate My Baby from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Which I never really saw... Too much Buffy Vampire Slayer growing up and haven't seen it really. Did you at least know that there was a band by the name of Dingo's Ate My Baby in the middle of it? I think I remember something like that. Because it, I almost think like it was a decent didn't plot. A, didn't point. a band perform at like the last episode? They performed in many episodes in the Peach Pit. I'll be, it wasn't the, the band. Pit? What was that? Peach Pit? Is the Peach Pit 902 and 0? Yes. Oh, I got the wrong, <laughs> I got the wrong place. <laughs> I'm not sure where they performed. It doesn't make a difference. Multiple episodes, the band, which was not Dingo's Ate My Baby, it was like a completely other band by the name of Four Star Mary, who is making all of their, uh, uh, making all the music that kind of got played in the middle of actual episodes. Oh, okay. Sometimes it was background music. Sometimes it was a little bit more foreground, but more often than not, characters were talking over it. It's kind of funny because there's, there's not, uh, as much call for, there's a term for this. You know, there goes my film class 101 out the window for digestic music. The idea that there are sound effects that are natural to what you're watching and there's sound effects that are obviously not part of what you're seeing. And uh, soundtracks... And vice versa, John. If you remember, there are certain songs that were on soundtracks. Yeah. That, that had... Noises and sound effects in the in the music yeah. that were from the movie. So if you turn on a radio in the middle of a in the middle of a movie, or someone oh. turns on a radio in the middle of a movie, and a song is playing, that's part of the movie. It's part of the world. But if a, but if a song plays in the background, it's given a different name. I've completely forgotten what it is now. But there there isn't that much call in TV series for a band that just keeps popping up and playing their music. Although you would think that would happen more often. What with there being so many bands out there. And how, like, the TV industry and the music industry seem to be, like, an obvious crossover. I'd say that's fairly true. Like, um, I do remember there being a time when bands were more part of a show and it was more of a fabric. And then hit songs became the fabric. Where, you know, there'd be a curation of songs and those songs would show up in a show. Or a movie. I think the fact that this list didn't actually hit many that were like Four Star Mary that just kept popping up and playing yet another song. It's either this this list did a, does a very good job, but oftentimes the band is the show. If you're talking about this is Spinal Tap, well, Spinal Tap is the band. Obviously. It is the obvious yeah. thing. They also cite Scott Pilgrim versus the world in which the, the Sex Bombs is like the main band of that. Which is really funny because I actually, from what I remember, I really enjoyed watching that movie, but I can't remember what it's about, and I don't def- I definitely <laughs> don't remember the music. Well, I'll tell you this much. Instead of going back and watching the movie, it is a, good, it is a really good movie to watch. It's got some problems and issues. The comic book is excellent. And all the problems that make you go, do we, are you supposed to like this main character? He's acting like a total jerk are completely solved in the comic book because Scott Pilgrim is not a good guy. And it's one of the best ways of exploring that movie, of just going like, oh, wait, the protagonist is an idiot, and he's a bad person. And and this all makes a lot more sense when you're reading the comic book. (laughs) It's like he's treated as like someone who gets away with stuff, and it all comes back to haunt him in the comic book. And he starts to learn that maybe I'm making poor decisions. But in the the movie, (laughs) he not only gets away with it, but it's treated as if he did a good thing. And okay. it's it's a very strange separation where you're just like watching and be like, I don't quite, there's something about this I don't quite get. 
one of the reasons why I want to talk about the Sex Bobons because Crash and the Boys is another band in inside the, uh, the Scott Pilgrim universe, mm-hmm. and I always love Crash and the Boys because whenever they show Crash and the Boys on stage, they're all they've got like big hands and they're all like pointing in different directions while their song is playing, but you start to notice that no one's actually playing any musical instruments. <laughs> like everybody's always just jumping up and pointing at something. <laughs> like that is so- somehow how the music is being made by like pointing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can't see the amount of pointing. I mean, just John pointing is doing. left and right. There's a little bit of disco going on in there. <laughs> Pointed up and down. Uh, there was a, it might have been like um, if Nixon was a rock star. I think was uh, yeah. was kind of like in there as well. So let's throw away this list real quickly. I'm curious to think. Like, <laughs> No, because I could come up with like a few different fictional rock that bands that weren't in this. That weren't in this. Okay. That I think are really good bands. Right, yeah, yeah. Can you think no. of fictional bands that did you did no, you read no, this no. and think to yourself, what are a couple more? It's it's one of those things where I, I remember good movies that I like watching that had bands in them. I don't remember the actual bands or the movies themselves. It has to be a fictional band that throws a monkey wrench into it. Well, I, I mean, Bill and Ted. Uh, well, yeah, signs, that's the Wild which Stallions. Is, which is in they that, did list the Wild which Stallions. Is in that, yeah. yeah. But like, so that's where I was kind of going with that. Uh, but go ahead. I didn't give you the chance to really think about it. I was thinking about it while I was reading the article. Like, go like ahead. the entire soundtrack to Strange Days. Oh! <laughs> oh! Um, that's a great. That's a great movie. There's no and, one and, band and. in there. It's it's every single song. Strange Days came out in like 1996, 1995. Yeah, I think it was 1995, and it was about the future of the year 2000 when the ball dropped. So it is right on January 1st, 2000. So one of the things that happened in Strange Days, like amongst a bunch of other things, I really love this movie for a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons why is it was 1995's music culture looking forward only five years in the future and going, what is our music going to be like five years from now? And it's this really strange, like, so what they really did is they just take a look at like the rap scene, the grunge scene, and everything else that was happening in music during that time period, and tried to find a way, a path forward with them, yeah. using bands that already existed, and trying to find a way that they would actually stretch and pair out in the future. Wow. Um, uh, see, that's a really good point, and what I was going to say was that I think, you know, there are a lot of movies that are made together at the same time by different production houses that I've noticed that have different titles different plots but the same overall theme and i think strange days and fight club were two of those movies where it's like i think they both came out at the same time from what i remember and um and but they they take they take the same type of general theme i think from two different tacks i think fight club was technically 99 so this is a four-year separation okay I know, because we covered Fight Club on Pop. But I'm, I'm saying Strange Days really captured it very well. Strange Days did an excellent job. Like, they, they hit a lot of different angles. Like, just if you look at fashion, like, what they were doing, they were just, like, paying attention to what people were wearing in 1995 and trying to find a way forward. Because people were wearing costumes. They're wearing future costumes based upon fashion trends then. And they're, again, kind of funny and ludicrous to actually look at because it's it's it wasn't what 2000 looked like. But... It, it was interesting to see people's approach. Okay, yeah, um, I get that. They're obviously they're trying to make a dark future, and it's kind of funny because they're only looking five years in the future and making a dark, like saying, ooh, in the year 2000. And what do you think? Did 1995 support the viewing of the future as dark? It fed into the very big cyberpunk culture concept going on back okay. in 1995. I, I can see that, yeah. Cyberpunk itself is a world where industries control the world and not and not governments i I think that's the simple explanation of what cyberpunk is supposed to technically represent okay and that was a very popular theme in the mid 90s when we saw there was a crossover these companies are getting a lot of power and the governments are losing power to the companies i think that people saw that saw a trend towards that and just kind of went like well in the future it's just going to be all companies if that future comes it's going to be a while from now resident evil was that about that time period, too? The video game? The yeah. original Resident Evil? Yeah, it's about right, right in that corridor. The, the video game? Yeah. Okay, and then the movie was far after that. The movie was far after that, but the plot of Resident Evil, the overarching plot, is, yeah, yeah. that's definitely 1990. And that's more of like a uh, dystopian uh, corporate plutocracy or whatever? Yeah, I don't know how, like, the original game uh, was mostly about a company that was making zombies. I don't think it really got too far into the... Into the well, but that was the backdrop. Yeah, that was the understanding. The other band I thought of, which I presume you don't actually know, is uh, Carolyn Tuesday. You ever come across Carolyn Tuesday? 
Do you have a Netflix account, and have you actually seen this pop up in your Netflix account? I have not seen it. Okay. The general idea behind Carol and Tuesday is it's, it's science fiction. It takes place on Mars in post-colonization time period. So we get to see kind of like a future of music because Carol and Tuesday is very much about music. And the idea is at this point, music is mostly made by AI. Humans don't make music anymore. The really popular stuff's all AI driven. And Carol and Tuesday is, are kind of like young girls who found each other and they happen to work really well together and they're bucking the trend and they're kind of getting a little bit popular and this is something we haven't seen for a long time. And there's a lot of politics going on, a lot of drama going on. It's actually a really good show and it hits a lot of angles. I could sit here and talk about all kinds of story arcs, but then I'd get lost in the stories. That's probably the best way of just explaining it. But excellent show and a lot of good music from that. Not just Carol and Tuesday, but one of the main characters who is like a model that turns musician and she's supposed to be like the top dog in a sense, but she's kind of losing it all throughout the series, has a spectacular lineup of songs also. I'll link to Carol on Tuesday. Have to take a look then. Uh, but is there any fictional band in that? Yeah, no, it's it's flush full of fictional bands. The entire show has all kinds of fictional musicians that are clearly like, one of the characters is like a David Bowie archetype, who's like an elder statesman that kind of guides things through. Another one is like, uh, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, who hasn't been doing, who hasn't been singing for over twenty so years. So it sounds like they're not fictional; they're just redigested. It's tough to explain because I say that these singers are touchstones, and that the easiest way of explaining uh, what this character is like is to use David Bowie. But it's it's not really that. If I just actually kind of listed all their traits as as like, oh, this is an, uh, it, it would just take longer. Okay. Um, okay. So it's not it's not that clear cut. I would probably say eight musicians and bands kicking around in Carol on Tuesday. Whoa, wow. Okay. So um, half, more than half the list. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, at, at some right. point in the middle, it becomes like a battle of bands. So, too, so, so, so what other fictional bands, you know, in movies? So now, now we have to try to think of something. Oh, another one. The Ruddles. Um, the Ruggles? The Ruddles. Ruddles? Or the Ruddles. Ruddles. Monty Python's take on the Beatles. I thought that was the Ruggles. Is it the Ruggles? Yeah, I think it's the Ruggles. That's why I said. Is Ruggles. it the Ruggles? <laughs> yeah, all you need is cash. Um, is one of their songs. <laughs> um, it, well, so does that really count? I almost think that that's there is more a like, full soundtrack to the Ruggles. Like, well, they, no, no, no. But yeah, yeah, I get that. But I'm just saying, like, you know, as far as like, does it count? Because you wish common. they existed, or well, that you wish existed. Well, yeah, that's you, actually kind of one of the tricks here. And I don't actually know if I wish a, the Ruggles exist. They exist in of the way they already exist. They, there's so, an album cut for you, the sketch you, of the I'll Ruggles. You, you can listen to The it. reason why I like Wild Stallions, you know, in, in Bill, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure yeah. is because they didn't really play any music, per se, but they were just kind of like a band that, if, if you could hear their music, it would be fun. I don't know if it would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would like, be fun. They make it so mystical that it almost seems impossible to imagine the actual music of the Wild Stallions. Like, because as soon as you hear it, it's supposed, to be, it's supposed to cause world peace. Like listening to their music. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever that works. But that's the fun part, is that like the hook for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, be excellent to each other. That's all it is. And it's like, it's a simple hook. It's it's fun. It, it draws me in, you know, just to think about it. That, you know, it's a unifying theme. Sometimes it seems like the, the message behind music isn't necessarily something that is unifying in a way that I kind of like... I, the way that it makes me kind of like, it provokes me, you know, it's like, I like seeing passion. And I like seeing, you know, things like that. And I like to be provoked in a, in a way that is positive. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that they did. Spinal Tap, it was funny, you know, and a lot of the things they did was, were ludicrous as well. But it, I think there was a positive message to be had there. They would, you could always get something from like what the way that Spinal Tap did things. It's like, that was, that was kind of like fun. Now I'm going to playful, playful. I'm going to end up like, Scratching my brain for as many bands that pop up. Yeah, like in um, and you know, so so Wild Stallions was with for me. Apparently, was Strange Days your kind of number one? Uh, I, the entire Strange Days soundtrack is okay. is crazy. And then that. you know, what, 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 do, you, what do you think? What do you think? In the uh, the the Lost Boys, there was an entire sequence with like a saxophone player uh, involved in that. Like Kenny G. No, that guy's still playing. This the saxophone player that shredded. <laughs> He's, he's built 
like a brick house full of muscles Fabio out there as, sa- as a saxophone player? out there playing the saxophone playing the soprano saxophone Lou, Lou that Fingerio looks like looks player? like a toy in his hands Arnold Schwarzenegger and that guy player? is still playing fabulously the in- tick <laughs> <laughs> did he play saxophone <laughs> So, but which, but you're saying your number one was Strange Days or no? Yeah, was it sure. Lost Boys? Was, it mean, the buff, gonna, was it the Buff Saxophone? No, player? it wasn't the Buff Saxophone. Player. It was the Nerds. I can't of, believe it's not Buff. It was the Nerds of Revenge of the Nerds. That they had their own band and they made a song. No, it, it's definitely Strange Days that you wish existed. That that's, I wish existed again, now. That's a that's, that's a the point. Problem. That's the point of the because they did exist actually. They, they were a bunch of real bands that press pushed themselves. That's what happened. So Strange Days is it for you, John? Like part of the problem is some sometimes a band does exist even when they don't exist. Like, for example, the Archies, the comic book Archie, made a band by the name of the Archies for the cartoon show about Archie, and well, they like, released a hit single yeah, by the name I mean, of... John, we can go on the... We, this is, like, I think this is, are this they, is the essence. The essence of the conversation band, has been lost. Are they a fictional band? John, that the lost? essence of the conversation has been right. lost, I think. I'm just saying, the fictional band I wish was real was the Monkees. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly where I'm going with that. Is that just... <laughs> and with that, it has been a joy to talk with you, John. It's been a joy to talk with you. And as well. if anybody out there has any fictional bands that they wish had existed that we have not discussed, I would love to hear your comments. Yeah, and we did not actually cover all of the uh, fictional bands that are in this article, so feel free to, to flip through it. For yes, some, for some... It, it is it is worthy in its own right because it, it did it did provoke the conversation and. I think there is there's a lot of good start to that list. It gives you it gives me a little bit of gave me a little bit of you know something to think about with regard to like you know which bands that I really wish existed that did not. And I think Strange Days was a great one, just from my perspective. Take care, guys. Have a good night. Later. <laughs>